uh, for clarity around, uh, you know, certain questions. And I know that um, Heather takes time out of her week to offer those office hours, uh, which I think is just awesome because, you know, uh, at times when I was in a, in a classroom and I'm, and I'm like, I just need an answer on this, or I just need, you know, to talk to someone about something that, you know, is very important, whether it was as a CTE director or whatever position that you're in. Um, you know, I know I, I, now there's access to you where if I have a question about the endorsement or the endorsement process, I can get on to those office hours, a ask it directly. I don't have to ask the wrong people or, or hear about the rumors going on. Uh, so it, that's a great resource. I think that, uh, thank you, Heather, uh, for, for offering that time during the week and, and throughout almost every single week throughout the, um, uh, school year. So I just, I just couldn't do it this week because I'm at the conference, but otherwise, yep, every week. So we did also have, um, uh, some information on the IWAS work. Um, our recommendation at this time is to to wait to complete the application until August or September of 2023. And Heather, did you want to uh, talk about that, the reasoning behind that as well? Sure. Um, if so, there's there's two thoughts on it. Um, the the new platform and in, in the I was. Um, platform will be very, very specific. Um, so yes, the same information that you're currently putting in the PWR platform will be, um, unfortunately, we can't transfer over that, but there will be a lot of copying pasting that can happen. Um, but it'll be very deliberate with, especially I'm thinking about like the team-based challenges where it will ask for a description, what the authentic problem is. It'll have a drop down for uh, which uh, technical competency, which essential skill and so forth. So you feel free if you wish, especially, you know, if you're thinking that you're going to want to issue endorsements for obviously for 23, it would need to be in the current platform, but for 24, um, you can build it in the current platform. You could also create a document that that mimics the same thing that addresses the same questions. But um, just just a thought on that. You know, if, if you want to um, create one and have me review it um, after I'm done with all the 23 reviews, I can take a look at that just to see if that would if that would work. So that that's another option too. But um, for those of you who are a little bit further off, I would wait. I would still continue to collect all my information, but I would wait until the IWAS app opens up and then it's just a one-time entry for you. And Heather, I, I just think that's a great call out that, you know, don't wait to, to do this work or collect your data. Um, make sure that you are, are doing that up until you can uh, do the application on IWAS. Um, don't just wait to for the system to go up and say, oh, now I got to do the work because, yeah. um, You'll be you'll be a little right, behind because you, as you're working on it, you may have questions now, and so we can we can address those questions now and get that you know answered for you. So, yeah, thanks for calling that out. Mm -hmm. And then just um, some quick announcements um, coming up here in uh, 2022 2023. So we have um, a link here that has the ISB Career Connected Illinois Professional Lear Learning Calendar. Uh, those are professional workshops that uh, our team uh, put put on throughout the course of the year. Um, we also have access to our summer calendar where we have a whole host of workshops we're uh, putting on. Uh, we're actually going to be traveling the state to be doing a, a host of uh, team-based challenges uh, through, through uh, different geographic areas. And so if you're interested in having teachers attend or any type of educator who wants to get into that work with uh, team-based challenges, uh, that summer calendar is the one that you want to take a look at. And then uh, that last link there has the link to the um, application process and all the webinar information from uh, ISB. So really good links there in, in case uh, you're wondering how to access some of the information. And then uh, one other quick call out is the uh, differentiation for all students workshop is uh, happening April 25th at 3.30 p.m. That's an online and free uh, workshop. Uh, you can register using the link or you can go into the, the calendar that we, we provide. Uh, just in that last slide, there's the calendar link. But um, this one is 
really great for uh, programs that want to focus on differentiation for students, particularly in CTE. Um, it's one of those uh, call outs that uh, as a part of Perkins 5 grant, uh, you kind of have to hit on that as you're going through um, to use those dollars. So um, check out that uh, registration link. Um, I know that Shavina Baker is is working with our MTSS uh, department here at NIU uh, to, to really offer a great workshop there. So um, check that out if you have a chance on April 25th. Um, it, it could be someone from your special ed department. It could be CTE teachers. It could be an MTSS coordinator. Um, but just wanted to give you uh, that information uh, as a part of um, this training that's coming up. And then final, uh, one other quick one, our competencies are on the uh, ISBE webpage. So if you check out the Career Pathway Endorsement webpage, down at the bottom, you'll notice that the competencies are listed there. Um, you can click on them and it will call out the uh, essential skill competencies and uh, some of the other technical competencies um, if you're using that for curriculum purposes. Uh, or, or you just want to share that resource with teachers and staff uh, on the work that we're doing. And then one other one, if you're looking for communications uh, work around the uh, career pathway endorsements, these uh, career pathway uh, word marks are out there. Um, you just have to access them in the slide. Um, but essentially, they're there for your use um, in any type of communications around the career pathway endorsement. So a great resource there um, if you're looking to align to those types of uh, word marks. And then uh, I actually just got an email today from a, a person who was saying, hey, I'm not getting the messages uh, for the career pathway uh, group. And so I had to send them the link for our uh, uh, presentation today. And so uh, please, please make sure that um, you're uh, checking your spam and junk folder and that you're changing those settings to allow emails from the Pathways group. There's a lot of information that we're sharing on dates uh, for the career pathway endorsements. Uh, there's information in those emails around uh, what's coming up in, in our um, uh, workshops and, and meetings. And so, and then there's just also pertinent information that of what's going on in Illinois. And so uh, please check your spam and junk folders on that and make sure that your settings are not uh, blocking those emails. May 12th uh, at 9 a.m., we're gonna be having a conversation around team-based challenges, which should lead into uh, that work that we're doing over the summer on the team-based challenges workshop. So. Um, just wanted to give you an update on what it, it's going to look like for our career pathway user group meeting for the uh, May 12th at 9 a.m. We're going to be talking about team-based challenges. And so this is our official start to uh, the work that we're doing today. And I'm going to turn it over to Jason and Michelle. Um, so Jason, um, it's all yours. We're going to turn it over to Heather and Michelle. Oh. And I'm going to sit here quietly since I'm unmuted. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm excited to review some of the trucking mechanisms we have implemented here at District 211. And hopefully you can take pieces of this back to your district to help you support and manage uh, student completion of these endorsements. Um, Bill, if you want to go to the next slide. Next one. So I'm just gonna jump in here real quickly. This is kind of a little kickoff to this. And that, first of all, one of the things you'll see as Michelle presents is some of the specific tools the District 211 is using. And we are, we are not actually saying, oh, you need to use these tools. As a matter of fact, I think Michelle will allude to that at some point, or Heather I may jump in there because the reality is some of these tools actually may not make sense depending on the size of your district and certainly um, districts have already invested in tools. And so um, these are these are things we can certainly talk about as as follow-ups moving forward in terms of 
how do you use what you do already have? And so there's places it, to use most of our major student information systems that are in use in Illinois can be leveraged as part of this. Um, there's places to use, um, if you're a Google Workspace district, Google Sheets, if you're a Microsoft Office 365 district, uh, Excel. And so, and then with, with being able to share on either of those platforms, for example, to have the information with those who need it. Um, and then a couple other key things here, thinking about who's doing the different work. This can't all sit with any one person um, it, in any size organization, frankly. It can't all sit with um, just the teachers who are teaching the courses that are included in the Career Pathway Endorsement course sequence. It can't be a sole responsibility of the counselors. And a lot of, I'm gonna be real honest here, a lot of what you're gonna to hear today, um, Michelle did put on her own back last year and say, I'm gonna do this and this is how we're gonna get organized around this as, as this school district really ramped up their number of endorsements. And, um, and so, but it, it can't rest with a single individual. And we know of course that hundreds of districts in the state don't have people in like a director of college and career readiness or a curriculum director position. and so. Um, and finally, uh, remember, we continue to make the recommendation. You do not have to do it this way. There are lots of ways to do the team-based challenges. You can do them through a CTSO. You can do them through a special event, so long as they meet all of the requirements of the team-based challenge. Um, but our recommendation for a variety of reasons is to embed them in the course. And the reason we bring that up now is because one of those reasons we recommend that is because it saves trouble with tracking. It's one less thing to track. If we know that students who successfully completed this course completed this team-based challenge, you're good there. You've got one less thing taken care of. So Bill, I think you can advance and we'll hand it back to Heather. Oh, Heather may want to jump I, in. But yeah, can I, can I add one more thing? Um, in addition to embedding those team-based challenges into the courses, um, I also am recommending, if, if it becomes obvious when I'm doing the reviews, that things like the career exploration, for example, the job shadowing or site visits or so forth are also happening in the courses. I, I always put a recommendation that, you know, it's recommended that you would identify the course that that's happening in, again, for the tracking purposes, so that you can verify that if that student has taken that course, not only have they completed a course in the specific course uh, pathway sequence, but they have also done a team-based challenge and they've done career exploration in that as well. So those are just some of the, the other reasons there. I just want to add that into that. So I think we can advance and Heather's going to, nope, Heather's going to jump in. Michelle's going to start talking. I'm Michelle's going to talk. And if I want to add something, I will just casually in. interrupt her. <laughs> That's perfect. So as Jason mentioned last year, when we were trying to finalize and start tracking our student completion in the pathways, it can be very overwhelming in a district this size. And so I think that if you are a smaller district, you can do, definitely do this through spreadsheets. And many of you may know on one or two hands, the students that are um, intentionally put into these tracks and be able to work and track that in a different way. But with 13,000 plus students, five to seven buildings where we have students potentially earning these, there would be no way for us to do this. So I was very logical and intentional in the tracking. So when I say this, there'll be times that maybe a student is going through a track and may not meet all the criteria and I may miss them. And I am very comfortable saying that's okay, I will capture it somehow later, but my initial take has to be that logical. So at the end of the day, I think we all agree, college and career pathway work is good for all students. Whether or not we're reporting it or not, yes, we wanna capture it. We wanna be able to be proud of the work that we're doing in our buildings. But when we put this together, if you are a large district, even a small district, I don't think you want these one-offs because that's where you are going to be completely overwhelmed. Uh, Jason also alluded to partnerships with teacher, counselor, parents, and community. All of them are stakeholders in this. I cannot do this work by myself, right? So I engage a lot of conversation um, to make this work. And then I just, you know, the big district versus small district is definitely important. So go ahead, Bill. 
And one thing I will call out, there are big districts that one of the things we find in the first year or two, I, and I'm thinking of specific districts, including one right now, where they, they only have three kids getting an endorsement this year, which is fine. Remember, one of the slides we don't have in today's slide deck is, this is about the depth of the, the quality of the experience for those students earning the endorsement. And then in terms of breadth, it's about how it impacts what kinds of authentic experience, what kinds of career preparation, what kinds of counseling experiences and what kinds of uh, authentic learning all students are benefiting from across the school and district. And so um, it's, it's not unusual in your first few years or maybe in the long term for you to kind of know, well, these are our seniors that we're talking about here and, and have those, those students be individually identified. So when I started to take a look at this and I wanted to capture student data, I thought about it very logically and I started uh, just putting it into a spreadsheet and then this spreadsheet morphed into a lot more and it became my central hub of data collection and being able to explain this um, very logically to my tech team, for example, being able to sit down with counselors, um, my CTE teachers or really any teacher to say, this is what a pathway looks like and having the conversation, did I miss something? Um, is there other uh, experiences like a field trip that I'm missing that's always embedded um, that gives them career exploration? Are there other certification industry credentials that I'm missing? Um, so I put it in a interactive Google worksheet because we use Google, uh, but I'd like to share my screen to kind of show you. I know it's hard to read here. Um, so I'm going to take the risk in front of all of you to let, literally interact with the screen to see if I can share kind of what this process looks like. So, Bill, if I can. I'm going to stop sharing and then, Michelle, you can go ahead. Okay. All right. So here is um, the Google Sheet live, and I will see if I could even make this a little bit bigger for you to see. Um, so the year that I send the endorsement, I put the year that it was approved um, through ISBE just so I can be very clear on which students I'm targeting. The year that we actually wound up implementing because maybe we didn't have our team-based challenges ready or we weren't 100% on work-based learning, for example. Um, then I list the pathway endorsement and I put them down as polls so I can clearly um, get my data correct. I put the related career cluster. So I have the 16 clusters tied to the seven pathways. Um, so I can be clear and intentional on how that aligns. And then I went one step further on exactly what the concentration area is within the district. So for education and training, for example, we're um, lucky enough to have embedded early childhood, elementary, secondary ed into there. So to make sure, and this is, our curriculum is more robust than I'm what I'm showing you here, but this is allowing me to track the college and career pathway endorsement data. Um, so what I wanted to find out were where are the students earning those six dual or college credits? And so I went in and I put the college course code along with our dual credit course code embedded in here. So for example, a student in secondary ed has to take EDU 201, which gives them two credits. And they also have the option to either take speech um, 101 or AP psychology earning a three or above on the exam. So this is how our students in this particular uh, pathway would earn their six uh, college credits. Then I go in and I say, well, this is where we're embedding our two team-based challenges in this EDU 201 first and second semester. Um, we actually take our team-based challenges and have them approved through curriculum and make them a critical learning standard for that particular course. Uh, so we ensure that our teachers are delivering exactly what we had discussed. And then the course code that is tied to the work-based um, learning, um, knowing that there are 60 hours embedded of experience in there. And then I just added other course required, any um, additional pathway courses that are recommended, any certification and credentials that the student may earn. This is also embedded into a spreadsheet for our entire district and any credentials uh, that we may offer. And then 
just confirming, yep, these are the English and math ready requirements. And then I track each year how many students actually earned and then is hyperlinked to the spreadsheet that I ultimately send to Heather so she could report that out. Now, when I talk about uh, the team-based challenges, we track them here. So as they are being developed in each one of the areas, I will update this and then I will embed them here and then link them. So if we ever get questions exactly what is that team-based challenge, we will be able to say what it's called, the course name and number that it's embedded in, what our critical learning standard is, it's manufacturing team-based challenge, not very unique, the course type, the pathway and the cluster that it's aligned to, um, what problem they're trying to solve, the outcomes, who our partnership mentor is for this particular um, team-based challenge. And then we embedded the essential employability skills and technical competencies this is specifically for METs. Each one of them has their own sheet, so it's specific to them. Uh, we would like to see one, no more than two of these selected to make it very concentrated and direct for that team-based challenge. And then I've asked my teachers um, to put the outline of information here, just, you know, it's bigger than us, right? It should be systemic. So if that teacher was no longer teaching that course, for example, they could easily pick up a sample of what exactly is supposed to be delivered. Um, and then I just keep copies of any other information um, that we need or need to reference moving forward. So you can see as we are working through these, we're putting submitted, we continue to work. Here's the manufacturing. This is what it looks like. They will get more and more complicated as we go through this for sure. And that's why I was trying to start small, be intentional and clear, and be able to go through each one of these components. So when we one, fill out the application, we know exactly what we're reporting out and having a central location for this. Two, working with teachers, working with students, counselors, I can reference this. They could understand what coursework needs to be completed in order for them to earn this. Um, and three, just for my own sanity, having it all in one place is very, very helpful for me. Um, so does anyone have any specific questions on this tracking? And then I'll show you how I get some reporting out of this. So first of all, I did drop into the chat, Michelle, we have gotten multiple requests, both in the chat to everybody and direct to me asking, um, and I'm, I'm not surprised if Bill or Heather may have gotten some too, but if this can be shared. So that's something I've said we'll discuss afterwards in a template format. Um, and so in terms of one question I would ask on behalf of the group, and if other people have questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat. This is a, this is a Google Sheet. Um, and so who is this shared with anybody besides besides you? Um, I have shared them with my CTE department chairs, so they have access a uh, viewing access. My technology department has access. My student service counselors have access for viewing just as a reference. Ideally, this is not a good document to share out with students. I think it would make it complicated. Uh, for them. So we're working on creating a uh, pathway document. Uh, my goal and my background is uh, school counseling is I would love to be able to provide summary sheets for counselors. So when they're in that course request time and students are like, oh, I'm really interested in, you know, business management, for example, and they say, oh, have you thought about taking these courses? You know, I feel it's never too late to get them on track. Even if a senior comes to us and is like, I'd really be interested. Maybe they don't earn the CCPE, but wow, I have a really good foundation for them to start taking coursework. So this is the planning document, the forward facing document to our students' parents um, will look a little bit different. Great call out. So lots of kudos to Michelle in the chat, um, well-deserved. Are there other questions about this? One that can edit this, Michelle? Is that, is that something that you're the only one that can put information in? Yeah, I actually am very selfish with my data because I've seen <laughs> what could happen when you share it out. Um, I, my tech department has access to it. Um, 
and my assistant who works closely with me, but outside of that, nobody else can make modifications. All right, so Bill, I think you can fire up your slide deck then. Um, and Michelle's gonna continue by telling us a little bit more about the data as it, particularly as it relates to um, the students is where we're gonna kind of shift to now. So then, well, in theory, this is all great. And you know, you work in, for those of you maybe working in a district building, you feel a little bit in isolation and you're like, oh, how am I gonna get this out? How am I gonna track this information? Um, so I went to my tech department and asked them if they can create me some visualizations in Tableau. Now, I know many of you may not have access to Tableau, but there are other ways to be able to pull this data um, for sure. And as much as I'd love to log into my Tableau to show you, I can't obviously because the student data is in there and it's very active. So I want to talk through this as best as I can um, to share what this does. So um, based on that Google worksheet that I just shared with you, I went through all the criteria that is needed uh, with my tech department. And I said, I only want to see students who are enrolled in those core courses um, that will lead them to the pathway endorsement. So the, the ones that are giving them the six credit hours. And when they did that, and I'm sorry that the screen can't be made a little bit larger, um, but then the student information starts to populate and you can see very quickly, here's the pathway um, in that little box. There's the pathway endorsement, the career cluster and the concentration. And the green boxes for coursework means that they successfully already completed it. The yellow means they are on track to complete, either they're currently enrolled, um, they're working on their team base, you know, the courses, uh, they're enrolled in that team based challenge, they have the work based learning embedded, those are all in there. And then the college, um, the re reading and the math ready is based on their proficiency, right? So their SAT, their dual credit. Um, if they're in transitional English and math, which would be senior year, that's why you may see the yellow boxes that they're in progress. Like there's a potential they may not earn this, but they are doing all the right things to get there. And then overall, is there a chance in this senior year, in this capstone part of their coursework that they're going to get it? And you can see that the yellow is they're overall ready. So we can communicate out to students you are on track to earn the college and career pathway endorsement. It is not a guarantee until that transcript is final, but you are on track to earn what that looks like. Can I just call out one, one reminder? Because there's a lot here. Again, we are only looking at 12th graders right now. So if we were looking at ninth or 10th graders, we'd see a whole lot of light gray not taken, for example, uh, because the data wouldn't be there. So I just... I just wanted to kind of center everybody on that. And again, you can notice in the school column, for those of you in multiple school districts, in districts with multiple schools, let me say that more clearly, um, you, you, you see that this is pulling at the district level in this case. Um, and this is very interactive. So if I wanted to just to see the students who will meet, um, if you see the D211 concentration box um, and it says total met, total will meet, total not met, I can very easily click on any of those boxes and the students automatically appear below. So I know exactly. I can sort by school, by endorsement, um, ethnicity, gender, I can pull a student specifically, and then I have an opportunity to export those out to Excel so I can share data out. On the bottom is another little clip, but when I select a student, it will then appear below the student's name, uh, details for, you know, Jason Klein, for example, the endorsement that they're working at, um, the career cluster, sorry, you got to take that from the um, the concentration, and then you see the coursework that is getting them to that CCPE, and then any other additional pathwork coursework that they had taken. So the yellows very clearly show they're actively enrolled in that course. I use this a lot to see why students aren't making it. Like I would be like, okay, they have all this, including the work-based learning. Like 
where are we falling short with students? So it would be a long-term tool for us to be able to really get into data like, wow, how come they didn't take transitional English or math? Like it was that is what stopped them from earning the CCPE. Like, and then working backwards with counselors and teachers to make sure that senior year we're being very clear and intentional on course selection. So we have one question in the chat and as you have ideas or questions, please drop them into the chat. Um, does this automatically update with your student information system, which just call it to everybody. Uh, District 211 does use Infinite Campus, which you see at the top there, whenever a new student enrolls. Daily, this gets, every night it is updated. So as a student transfers in and out, as any course changes happen, this data is updated. So one thing I'll mention, and, and some of the people on this call know that for a period of time, I was responsible for, at the district level, systems like Power School and Infinite Campus. And so um, Infinite Campus, for example, has a, an offering where they bundle Tableau with it, but you you don't need that to to work with an extra system. There are lots of ways to, and, and you're, even in a small district in, in many cases, like if you have a point of sale system in the cafeteria and you have students earning, uh, earning um, who receive, excuse me, uh, free or reduced meals, then there's probably a nightly job where at 2 a.m. or at 2.21 a.m., uh, your student information system offloads an updated copy of who the students are that are enrolled. And so there's a one day lag that's typical in these things, but, um, and so that is, that that can be done in a variety of ways. And there's even ways to do that, uh, to connect Excel, for example, uh, with an updated list. So again, just trying to make this accessible to districts of a wide range of shapes and sizes. And it's certainly an area where if there's interest, we, we can pull the right people together and, and do additional deep dives uh, in the future. But I think that if something like Tableau or you couldn't pull this specifically, I know in Infinite Campus, and I'm very good at the ad hoc reporting, I could create reports that would be able to pull that. It might not be one report because some of this data isn't going to be linear, you know, and I'd have multiple tables, but I'd be able to embed all of that into there and be able to um, bring my data together. And and really, like I'm highlighting some of these pathways that have been part of our culture embedded. We're, you know, we've had some of the partnerships in our community with education, for example, with our grade schools, really to get these students those opportunities. Um, so it looks like a lot um, here, but these are really strong pathways for us. Um, and this was low hanging fruit for our district to be able to use this as sample data to try to hone into a process for this. Um, I do want to mention at the top, um, there are some buttons um, that I can tab into different screens. So Bill, if you can fast forward to the next screen. Um, I have some summary reports here, and this is no data, obviously, for obvious reasons, but I can very quickly um, aggregate my data just so at the end of each year, I could see um, my populations of students. Are we not reaching certain students like with 504s or IEPs? What's happening with our low income students? Are we not capturing them in pathways? in terms of an equity? Is it because they don't have transportation? Is there other things that are going out? How can we help them achieve and have equitable delivery of services for all our students? So this is a snapshot for us. And I didn't put it on here, but there's also a very quick button that I just have my ISB report based on the criteria that Heather is looking for at the end of the year that I can push the button and then get the list of my students that way and uh, provide it to the state. So, I'm going to pause for a second and say this is a lot of information and it is very overwhelming and it's still very overwhelming for me too to be truly transparent and authentic um, in the delivery of this, but I wanted to start very slow. I just have really three pathways. I've got a couple under review right now. I do not have a lot of students who will continue to grow like the trajectory of CCPE will look like this, and then eventually, you know, may start to flatten out just because it's every student is not going to earn this endorsement, right? And we're going to be very intentional 
Um, but it will actually, if you have a system like this, it will be, it will make it much more manageable um, and enjoyable to see the hard work and what it looks like at the end for students. Michelle, great job on uh, sharing that information with everyone. But also, I just I love this slide because uh, from the work that I was completing in in my uh, former work as a CTE director, I you know I could take this information and see how it's impacting the special populations in our school and and just use that to report out to staff and uh, administrators about it. Thanks. Heather, do you have anything to add um, here based on you know, what you've seen and experienced? This was part of the reason we wanted to help people with this now so they could at least start tracking you know, the smaller numbers. Mm -hmm. And again, we, we may very well, what I'm, I'm kind of seeing from today, I'll just say this out loud to everybody, is this is probably something we will need to loop back at uh, maybe right at the beginning of the year in, in August or September. So, and no apologies before, Heather jumps in. Let's let's ans yeah. ask and answer this question. Sure. Uh, would there be a way? Oh, I'm going to actually defer to Heather on this is an interesting question um, on you know mobility and obviously we have both in district and across district mobility that that can be issues for there's you right. know there are not as many high schools districts with high schools that will have in district mobility but we certainly have we certainly have some i think i think a lot of that to answer that that question would have to be which career pathway we're talking about so if we had a student that transferred from one school to another one district to another um really school level probably with this one um if that that district uh and has the has that approved plan and then they transfer to another district that also has that same plan, I could see where, where perhaps that would be allowable for us. I don't know a way to, to report uh, besides picking up the phone and calling and letting them know that they were in, you know, close to completing that or they have done, you know, this component of it. Um, but that's definitely something that we'll need to explore. But uh, honestly, in order for that to to recognize that student as completing a full pathway endorsement, that would have to be the criteria that that both districts have that same career pathway approved. Heather, um, now anything else you want to add? <laughs> yeah. Sure. Um, I know that when Michelle and I first talked and and we were we were looking at this and she she shared this with me. Of course, I was blown away and I, I thought, oh, this is fantastic. This is a great way to do this. And then immediately I put on my small school counselor hat and thought. Okay, we don't have access to these things. This is not, it's not going to be feasible. However, the, the first component of this with the spreadsheet, that is incredibly doable for, for the smaller districts and certainly a way um, that you could take a look at um, it, you know, even if you couldn't break it down by student, you could certainly look at enrollment numbers to see how many of those students are taking, say you have the, the four classes. Um, sometimes it's just, you know, the two classes um, within your course sequence. And if you can look at those enrollment numbers to see how many of them are going on and taking the next one, that, that can provide you some of that, those data points that you could use later on um, to uh, encourage students to keep going, so to speak, with that. So I, I think that there's a benefit even at the, the basic level, uh, although I would say Michelle did a, a ton of work to make that <laughs> spreadsheet basic. Um, but organizing it in that manner is what I'm seeing most common with with a lot of the districts. Um, and so uh, I think I, I think I just want to make all the districts aware of that, regardless of, of the size, as Jason had mentioned, um, you can adapt this to to work for you to keep a better handle on um, how you can monitor uh, the requirements and if a student meets that. And, and then the only other part I would mention too, um, when we get to the um, recognizing students, you know, one of those components is for the academic readiness. Remember too, that it is following the structure of the CCRI academic readiness. So there's multiple um, opportunities for a student to meet that beyond just, I know how Michelle's got that built in and, you know, I'm sure she's going to expand on that too once the, that, that gets finalized, but you've got all those options as well for, for those students to meet those targets. So 
I do say to on the so can you go back one? If you are looking to track on a smaller level, like I in my original, if I couldn't pull something like this together, I would have taken for each one of my approved pathways, I would have pulled my students that were currently in the capstone class, for example, and then worked backwards. And I would have made each one of these fields at the top of my spreadsheet and made check boxes. And yeah. then if once the final overall was completed, you could just very easily, you know, Excel, Google Sheets, that line would become green, for example, right? And then you would be able to very quickly track, and I would actually do it based on the report that Heather wants have all those fields embedded in there as well, including your local school course codes and tracking. And you wouldn't maybe need all the bells and whistles of the extras, right? You know, you would just make sure you're very clear and intentional on your pathway. And I would add things like gender and, you know, some of those other things that you may want to um, disaggregate later. But from a smaller school, like you could absolutely take this kind of mindset and transfer it into uh, a spreadsheet and even link it to that master spreadsheet, honestly. Well, and again, the one the one call out I'll make too additionally is when you look at the student at this exact format, I know of very, very big schools this year that are essentially built a spreadsheet and are just right. hand typing in. They have the name of the four nursing students who are going, who are on track to earn an endorsement. And they essentially have these same columns. They might have, instead of coursework, each of the courses in the sequence, for example, and then, and they're just checking them off and they're, they're checking in regularly. And, um, you know, I'm not even sure who, uh, who has access to that. So I just want to point out that this is especially important, depending on your district's resources or the size of your district, but some of these things truly do cut across um, district size. And, and one of the other things that I don't know that Michelle said it as, as clearly today as she has said it privately, she has found that there may be some advantages to being a, a smaller district um, because it does in this, in this very large district, it is all still funneling into her. And if she were in a smaller district, it would still be funneling into her but it would be less to manage in terms of, I think there maybe the number of buildings may be one of the big, one of the big factors. So I think there are, this is truly a case of there are pluses and minuses. And I will tell you that at, from Jason alone, and I'm, I know as a team, we will all, we're gonna roll up our sleeves as a result of today to say, okay, how can we make this even more accessible and more doable to give people more templates, so to speak, to fit different people's needs and even thinking about what the different student information systems can and cannot offer, because um, there are some differences. Um, and we're, we're lucky that, that there are three major ones in school districts uh, in Illinois, but we have to think about districts also that are using one of the other ones and the fact that you are probably not the decision maker if you are on this call about what student information system you are using. And you, know, you shouldn't switch student information systems because of career pathway endorsements either. Like that is a switching student information system is a heavy lift in and of itself. So uh, lots for us to continue to, to work on supporting everybody with. And if you've got great examples of this, please share this, your examples with Heather, Bill and I, so we can leverage those and engage with you about that. Thank you guys. Thank you, uh, Michelle, for sharing this information. I think, we had some great questions on this, uh, and, and obviously people are impressed with the level of work I, that you've put into it. So um, I know just with what Jason said, uh, getting some information out to uh, the Career Pathway user group um, on some type of template will be uh, a, a great strategy moving forward. So, so we're going to move into our uh, question around how schools celebrate the endorsement. And so uh, this was actually the work of our group, of our Career Pathway user group. And uh, essentially the survey we created went out uh, about a month ago and we were asking you, our, our, you know, our Illinois high schools, how they were celebrating um, the endorsement. And the results came in and uh, we wanna just kind of take a, a moment here to, share what those results are. 
So under the events portion of the survey, we asked the question, how do you celebrate your students completion of the career pathway endorsement with events? 80% um, of respondents said they have a senior awards night. 30% uh, said career pathway signing day, which I thought was a fantastic opportunity. Um, you know, we think about how we have signing days for sports teams and uh, athletics and, and players who are signing on to a college. Um, but oftentimes we don't think about how um, the career pathways can play into that and how a student signing on to a work pathway um, um, could could be just as a highlight uh, in our high school. So I just thought that was a great opportunity that um, high schools are, are doing that in the state of Illinois. And then others have an honor ceremony. Another 30% have a uh, specific honor ceremony uh, regarding their events. And when we look at external communications on you know, celebrating the students, how it's being shared with the community. 60% uh, use a school district newsletter. Another 60% use social media posts. Uh, we saw 60% showed that they were using the district website to celebrate uh, their students. Uh, oftentimes with, you know, pictures of uh, them holding a certificate or, you know, having having uh, media on their website celebrating them, um, have, placing a list of names from either the school or schools that that district represents. Um, oftentimes they had their communications team work with the local newspaper uh, to develop a story around the career pathway endorsement. Um, so some school districts reported using a school district blog on that, and I think that's a great opportunity uh, for leaders that want to uh, take on that work and, and write up a blog and work with their communications team uh, to celebrate uh, the students receiving the endorsement or or highlighting them and with an interview uh, of some sort with the blog. And then finally, the last two radio, there were uh, one or 10 percent of uh, school districts reported that they were using radio and no reports of uh, any TV stories. So maybe an opportunity there for uh, school districts that want to highlight that. And then with our uh, awards, we this came up um, uh, about a month ago where we had uh, people asking, you know, are we, what are we doing as a state in regards to celebrating this endorsement? Is there a certain um, type of award that the state is going to look into? And I think right at this point, the conversation is let's find out, like what, what are school districts uh, really doing with uh, this type of idea. And so we found that 66% uh, of the schools that responded uh, offer a certificate of some sort to the students that uh, received the Career Pathway endorsement. 55 offered a honor ceremony recognition. 44% are doing the uh, graduation program uh, award type where they're, they're placing them in their uh, program and saying they ha received a pathway endorsement and they also receive a tassel at graduation, which is a, uh, you know, one of the questions that came up about a month ago. Um, some of them are receiving a career related gift, uh, whether that gift is uh, sometimes purchased from an outside organization or maybe a local business or uh, st stakeholder group. Uh, those students are receiving that gift uh, at the at the end of the school year. So we think about, you know, if I'm a student that received or received a construction pathway endorsement under the uh, MET pathway, um, you know, what kind of gift would that look like? Is it a work belt with um, some tools in it? Um, you know, if I'm a uh, medical student in the um, health uh, pathway, you know, do I get a stethoscope? Uh, or, or some type of gift like that, 11% of um, districts reported that. And then another 11% uh, reported getting a graduation pin. Uh, we wanted to share this information with the group because we felt like it was important as, that, as those conversations were happening to just show that um, these are going on, these kind of celebrations and uh, uh student awards are happening throughout the state and that 
you know, we want to continue this conversation around, you know, do school districts offer a tassel? You know, I, we even had some people, well, what's the tassel color? You know, uh, I think that's something that school districts have to uh, approach within their uh, inside communications and decide how they want to celebrate it and what are the certain trends that are happening around the state. And then uh, some of the comments that came up as a part of the um, survey, and, and we just wanted to share these because um, they, they are comments and we wanted to uh, give a voice to those who responded to the survey. Uh, the first one said, I would love to see is be an Department of Labor jointly put communications out in Illinois on the what and why and the ask. And then the second one uh, basically says, because this is a current and ongoing discussion, the consideration of recognition has not been discussed in depth. And so um, those are, we're just going to leave those comments as, you know, placeholders for uh, furthering our conversation. We just wanted to share out that those were um, two of the uh, highlighted co uh, conversation components as a part of the comments. And so at this point, uh, we want to um, just kind of pivot a little bit. We want to bring in that idea uh, around celebrations uh, and, and what is happening currently around the state. And so I am going to actually uh, turn it over to Dr. Eric Lasky, the assistant principal of Ridgewood High School. Thanks, Bill. So when we look at celebrating our students, and this is sort of, you know, we've added everything each year. So it's not like we came up with these ideas uh, right away, but we've been adding everything. And so we do recognize our students at the end of the year award banquet. Uh, we chose a royal blue cord for them to wear at graduation. And sometimes people ask, why do you choose royal blue? Uh, mainly because that was not being used in any other areas. Um, so the ones available, we really like that. We put all our students' names on our Career Pathway website, which is good because if we have questions about something, it's easy to find, other people who find it. And the other thing we do is we, instead of like celebrating necessarily them at the board meeting, we have our students present to our school board about the work they've done and how it's sort of impacted them. Um, so this does sort of celebrate their work, but the best part about this, it also informs our board about the work and helps us out um, as we move forward. I did want, before we move on to the next slide, because uh, a lot of times people will ask, what does that mean that they earn this on their transcript? So you can see this is a sample transcript um, and, you, and you'll see the endorsement right above the uh, state seal by letter C. So this particular student earned both, both of those. So you, can, so you see now what it looks like if they do get this uh, endorsement and how it's put onto their transcript. All right, next slide. So what about, you know, just touching on how we track this? So we do have some lead teachers for a couple of our programs and they will track uh, the information and report it back. But we also use Google Forms as well, um, you know, as we're looking, you know, to sort of find a better system. Right now, Google Forms is working for us. We do run some reports. Uh, we run our dual credit reports, our work-based learning reports. And the nice thing about our work-based learning reports, uh, working with Erica Kuba, Michael Kuhn, they help to uh, ensure that all our work-based learning courses are coded for each pathway. So that way we have more information when we do those things. And, the, and when you're looking at the big picture, we have been using school links this year and we're slowly getting that operation system set up because we wanna be able to easily look at reports and that way we can see, all right, what are the components that students are getting? Where are our deficiencies? Where do we need to improve on? Uh, we're a little behind in this because we're using a different system and trying that for two years before we finally realized it wasn't working. And then we moved on to school links. So on the next slide, I did want to talk about ensuring equity inclusion for our college and career pathway endorsements. It is now part of our K through 10, 12 PACE framework. Uh, so we really want this process to start a lot earlier than even high school. And if we want to have that equity piece, we really felt it'd be valuable to embed components into it. And then even in uh, eighth grade in our PACE framework, we're asking that all students select a college and career pathway endorsement they'd like to pursue in high school. That does not mean that's the one they're going to stick with, they're going to continue with, they're going to earn, but 
pick one you'd like to start with and at least uh, get going with. Also to make sure that all students have this opportunity to earn these endorsements, we embed some of this work into our core curriculum. So in our English 1 and English 2 projects, all the students will do a presentation um, about what pathway they're interested in. And in that presentation, they have to include stuff like um, job location, what are the job hours, what are the salaries, what are the educational requirements. And then we also ask them to choose a couple uh, post-secondary programs, whether it be a college or um, even in programs that we offer our community college, you know, pick something that, you know, you would like to, you know, maybe you pursue your post-secondary program. Uh, we embed it in our freshman math courses. They do a cost-benefit analysis along with the English classes. They then take that information and they sort of look at what are the long and, long and short-term expenses for the post-secondary program and then the long and short-term uh, salaries for whatever program they, they choose. So even embedding that and getting them thinking a little bit more in depth freshman year is great for our students. So providing options for each student. You know, knowing that in eighth grade, we want to have all our students to choose um, a pathway endorsement to pursue. We want to make, make sure there's an endorsement in every different pathway and some multiple options. Now, this is not something I recommend for, for schools that are just starting out with career pathways. You know, this is something we've been working on for four years. Um, so we're able to expand a little bit about our, with our work. Um, and in order to do that too, you have to partner, you know, we partner with our community uh, college Triton. Um, we are adding, we, this year we added some dual credit uh, for our peer students. So those are uh, our co-taught classes. Um, we wanna make sure that every student has the opportunity to earn that career pathway endorsement. So how can we get those dual credit into those classes as well? Well, it may be that the entire year is a semester credit, at least over two years, then they can earn that those uh, six credit hours. During um, COVID years, we had a little extra time for PD, and we used that time to, to work with all our elective teachers and embedding a team-based challenge with them. Because that's really, even if you're not looking at career path endorsements, that's really a best practice is to bring in those outside speakers, bring them in. So now that provides, more uh, once again, that opportunity for all our students to get those team-based challenges whether they're earning the endorsement or not. And then communication with parents. That, we start that with our eighth grade students on transitional night, um, and then we continue on almost on every communication we have, we like to share about the career pathway work. Um, as we move forward in the PACE framework, we will be doing that in even earlier years. And then the final part of ensuring that, you know, once again, we wanna reach everyone is we added a dual degree program pathway um, this year, which we had four students enroll in, uh, so they finished year one of that. It's a two-year program. And then we have eight that are going to participate in that next year. So we just want to make sure that all students have these opportunities um, and with our work. So thank you. I'm going to go to the question section. But um, while uh, we're kind of waiting, if, if you have a question, you want to throw it in the chat or uh, want to just speak to it. Um, one of the things, Eric, that I think that uh, the work that you're doing is is that it you mentioned that this is work that's happening over four years, right? It's not something that is happening in this like one or two year time limit and um, on how you're offering the career pathway endorsements through throughout to every kid. It's not every kid is going to receive that career pathway endorsement. It's offered, but you know, there's going to be a limited amount of, of students that um, actually receive that. So I wanted to make that clear um, as a part of your, as a part of your work. Yeah, no, that's correct. Uh, you know, our goal is once again offer the opportunities, um, and then if students pick, they pursue it. We you know we provide that pathway, but no, not every student um, has earned it or is gonna you know may say going to earn it. But at least you know take the dual credit classes. Um, and pursue that a little bit is what we'd like. And one other quick question, Eric, is when you when your district tried to um, start looking into that conversation around the celebrations component, like wh where where did it begin? Like what was that? Um, you know, at what point were you was your district saying, "Man, we we have to celebrate these kids"? Like wh where did that start at, and what? Um, how did that conversation go early on? Yeah, 
we've always, um, you know, we always, our school board always likes to hear from the kids. They don't necessarily like to hear from us as much. So bringing them in has always been sort of like our tradition. We have three meetings a year. We always bring kids in to talk about this work. Actually, uh, I think three years ago, Jason Klein, we invited him as well. And he came in and talked to uh, our school board about this. But that's, you know, something that we just traditional. We always celebrate that work with our school board. But then as we moved on, we realized, okay, we're recognizing all these other compliments for students. We need to embed this into our awards night. And then after a year later, we're like, we also need to have this part of our graduation. How can we make that part of our graduation? Let's get a cord for our students to wear. Uh, so it's really, you know, those things, every year we just find something new we want to add in with those celebrations. That's great to hear that uh, those conversations are happening and that, you know, the, the community is playing a, a key role in it as well as that, um, you know, that communication, I think, with the parents and the community. Like you said, you have a certain component with your CCPE going out to parents and community members each month that I'm sure that plays a significant role in this work as well. Yeah, yeah I think if you talk to the parents early on, like, you know, and, you know, we always use to like, this is, you know, if you look at ISB, this is a new initiative. This is something they really want students to earn. Um, you know, having that bigger backing behind it really helps as well. Um, and then you start to ingrain that into them and they start to think about it. Uh, and then it really helps if they're involved in the process as much as possible. Well, thank you, Eric, for sharing that process um, that your school district has gone through. Like you said, it's been uh, approximately four years since you got into this work. It sounds like you guys are doing great work at Ridgewood. And um, if you're a school district that is just getting started in this, you know, I, I think that um, advice of just, just get started and, and start with um, whether it's a, um, uh, a Google form or some type of just, you know, smaller information system, um, that that can be the starting point for you uh, in moving this work forward. And we, because we, yeah, we started with the manufacturing pathway and the education pathway because we had those things in place and those were really good, get those down. And then it's like expanding, moving on and trying to make sure we meet all the students in our school. So, but thank you, Bo. Hey, uh, Eric, that brings up a good point is, uh, what was the, um, what was the reasoning you started with those two pathways? Well, with manufacturing, we already had students going to TMA, uh, getting their credentials first semester, senior year, and then second semester, they were doing uh, internships, paid internships. So when you look at that, we had everything in place already. We had the dual credit, you know, you have the internship, you know, you get, then you build in the team-based challenges. Uh, those, I feel like, are the more difficult components to have. So that was uh, why we chose that one. Then also Education Pathway was the same thing where our students are going to Northeastern and they're taking two classes. So we already had the dual credit in there. And then uh, second semester, they do a mini student teacher internship. So the work-based learning was there. So it's like when you look at what programs you have and the components you have towards a college and career pathway endorsement, there's really some you know minor adjustments you need to add into them in order for those students to earn those endorsements. So those were the reason we picked those first two. Yeah, so I think that's a great call out is that you had existing programs where you were already doing some of that work and you just made a few tweaks to them um, in order to get that work uh, rolling for your district. Well, that's great. Um, well, I didn't see any uh, questions in the chat. I'm just gonna just make sure it, um, I think we're good, Bill. Okay. So we're going to so, move on to the currency and I'll, uh, yeah. Jason, go ahead and take it. Yeah. I'm going to jump in as a matter of transition. I do want to call out uh, Michelle's comment, <laughs> excuse me, uh, that she did make at the near the beginning of, of Eric's uh, sharing out. And, and Michelle, after all the awesome work we heard from Michelle, it was also great that she shared like, oh, this is a place that we've got lots of work to do. And and she specifically called out the challenge of if if your early credit, excuse me, early college credit courses include advanced placement courses, um, you are you're not going to know if students have met that requirement until July, right? So that that will have an impact on this. 
Ironically, next Friday is the ILSEP Dual Credit Summit being held in two locations, one at uh, College of DuPage and one at John A. Logan. And, um, and I'm, my presentation is about how last spring's legislation and the endorsements offers additional um, uh, support for dual credit. And so, and, and that really speaks to Michelle's, Michelle's question because that is a real challenge. And so, and it is a limiting factor and something that I think we can all continue to share solutions with one another um, around, around that. And as school districts look at where are we using AP or IB versus dual credit and what are the benefits and drawbacks? And, and certainly there are those for all of these, right? Um, the teacher credentialing is a, a much straighter, straighter road on advanced placement than it is on dual credit. And, um, you know, that's being worked on as well, but that's the reality. So with that all said, that also ties into things that are kind of beyond the scope of like ISBE's work, but very, very common conversations around the career pathway endorsements. And so there are 71 of us uh, still in the meeting right now. If I had a dollar for every time someone asked me about um, what does this get students in the long run, we would all be eating a nice brunch together while we did this. And so, um, and so monthly probably, and, and that is a very important question. So what, to kick this conversation off, I wanted to introduce it with a couple of things, and then we're going to kick it over to Megan uh, Mitchell, who's here joining us from Education Systems Center. And so with that, the couple of things I wanted to call it is, first of all, I think that the number one thing, we heard this a year ago today, I was driving from Oak Park to Mount Vernon, and a year ago tomorrow is beheld the first in its series of uh, CTE industry feedback tour events. And at, at the meeting that was 364 days ago, we heard from a Pepsi-Cola bottler with, uh, with um, plants and distribution centers in, in Illinois, along with Kentucky, Tennessee, and Missouri, that if this endorsement, this sounded amazing to him, and if students really came out, the students with the endorsement, with the skills that were represented by both the essential skills and the technical competencies, man, he wants to hire those students right away. But if they come out with the endorsement and they don't have those skills, he told us he's gonna be pretty turned off from hiring students like that again. And so, so th this is where our assessment piece becomes really important, something we do have control over the conversations we have with our partners in our communities. So these calls, we have a lot of very important people on these calls. We don't have a lot of superintendents. So we need to make sure our superintendents, for example, have the talking points. Some of your superintendents do, some probably do not. And that when they're out in the community, when they're invited to speak, they're talking about how students earning the endorsements look different as a result of those process. And frankly, how all of our students will look different than they did in the past because of the work we're all doing in the space. That will build currency. And so I think there's no way of avoiding that some of this is on us locally to have those conversations. And then as we engage with partners, we know there are many people on this call who have had incredible experiences with partners who would love to be champions. And obviously when they can go out and talk about this with, with their colleagues it, it, through the Chamber of Commerce, at Rotary, wherever, um, that's going to be incredibly helpful, right? Like we can't buy that. And so with all that said, um, we did ask a question on the survey about how the business and community partners recognize endorsements. Um, and so this, is, this was the answer to that. And Bill, you can go on to the next slide. Um, and so with that said, uh, what we really want to do, we know why people are asking about it. Because if we're going to spend all this time and energy, we want to make sure it's getting our students something. And again, part of my answer is if we're really doing a good job assessing and teaching all of the competencies, the essential skills and the technical competencies, we are setting our students up for success to get jobs and then to thrive in those jobs even more importantly. And so, so that's part of the answer. But the reason people are asking about it is because there is a lot for school districts to do. I am not telling anybody any anybody here anything you don't know. And so making this a priority 
does require the question of what does it mean for our students. So with that said, um, we're going to turn this over to Megan. Uh, Juan Jose had hoped to be here too, and unfortunately, he could not join us at the last minute due to a family a family matter. And so um, with that, we're thrilled to have Megan. And Megan, uh, you can go ahead and take it away. Thank you so much. First, I just want to say thank you so much, Jason, for allowing us space to talk about this. We're really excited about the work that our community college districts are doing to provide uh, currency on their end for students who uh, earn the College and Career Pathway endorsements. Next slide. And so again, my name is Megan Mitch. I work for Ed Systems Center. I'm the path pathway manager. And you all know my dear colleague Juan Jose. And as Jason said, he uh, had hoped to be here today, but had a family emergency and couldn't come. So uh, he sent his, his loves, his love and thoughts and good vibes to you all as well. Um, and so here's what we're gonna do today. So just in, in the few minutes that we have, we're gonna talk about um, some larger currency initiatives that's happening throughout our state. And then we're gonna hone into uh, directly what's happening within the community colleges. And then I'll pause for like some Q and A at the end. Uh, so you all know us, right? We're Ed Systems Center. Our goal and mission is to shape and strengthen educational workforce systems to advance racial equity and prepare more, more learners for productive careers. Again, our three focus areas are uh, bridges to post-secondary college and career pathways and data impact. Uh, our focus is statewide, and we have a huge initiative in terms of supporting various community networks and being very collaborative and innovative in this work. So I'm going to take some time just to kind of highlight uh, some larger currency options that are happening throughout the states. So we already know about the Golden Apple scholars of Illinois. Uh, we are aware of Illinois teacher, uh, teachers uh, scholarship, or I'm sorry, minority teachers of Illinois scholarship. And so students who earn the college and career pathway endorsements uh, will also be eligible to have like advanced standing in these particular application processes. One thing I do want to point out that's fairly new to this uh, statewide uh, currency pathway initiative is Illinois uh, Manufacturing Association uh, scholarship. And so this scholarship is new to this space and is offered for students who earn the endorsement in manufacturing. And so um, it, we're really excited about this initiative and it's like a low hanging fruit for students. Uh, the requirements are, are fairly uh, attainable. So uh, you just have to be an Illinois resident, high school senior, of course, a one letter of recommendation, either a 500 word essay or a two-minute uh, video recording, uh, just discussing what made you interested in a career in that particular field, and then a two-minute recording video or presentation showcasing a project or an item that you have created. So just uh, you know, say a shameless plug for this initiative. So if you all have students who are earning this endorsement, who may be interested in receiving some additional funding, please, please, please encourage them to apply for this. Next slide. And so now I want to get into some of the details of what we are doing. And so we are working currently on a project uh, with an outside funder where we are supporting and encouraging community college to provide currency for pathway endorsements. And so the primary focus of this particular project is to increase secondary enrollments uh, in college and career pathways, particularly in underrepresented industry areas, uh, increase the number of students who complete secondary pathways, earning the college and career pathway endorsement and the industry credential. And then of course, increasing those students who transition from high school into post-secondary programs, particularly uh, in community college and within the workforce. Uh, and of course, the main focus of this particular project is to develop currency and increase the value of college and career pathway endorsements within the community college space. Next slide. And so the expectation, you know, just to give you all some background information, expectation from our college partners who participate 
in this is that they published a currency uh, that they have with their high school partners for students by May uh, next month of this year. And so some sub expectations is that they work with their districts to submit uh, the pathway endorsement and other activities centered around that by fall of this year. Uh, we encourage and require them to consider an equity uh, plan and what that looks like for uh, some of our underserved populations and then include some strategies to address those particular students. And then we host a series of community practices to kind of support um, and help uh, colleges move along this process as well. Next slide. Okay, now here's where um, I show you, as you can see, some of the examples of what various community colleges are doing. So in the chat, I am going to paste a link to a blog post that we wrote that kind of outlines many of our community colleges and the work that they're doing. And so you all have that there. But as you can see, schools are really getting innovative with how they are supporting our, our uh, and earners, our endorsement earners. So some students who attend Illinois Valley Community College or Kaskaskia will be able to receive actual like stipends and scholarships, right? Depending on the pathway that they are entering. And so these hold like a financial value and incentive for students. As you can see, Parkland is partnering with uh, their local um, employers to provide job placements. Other institutions are hosting additional student supports, whether it's additional faculty hours, additional supports for those gateway courses, and then lastly, a big thing that I think is really exciting is those earners are eligible to receive additional points towards selective enrollment programs, which is key in, in, in providing support for those students. Next slide. And here you can see uh, some of our partner colleges the pathways that they are working with us on and then some of the currency initiatives. Next slide, please. And so one thing I, I don't know if you can see the bolded pieces here, but I wanted to highlight uh, the colleges that are outlined in that blog post and some of their partners. And so as you can see, they're working with various school districts, but they're also working with industry partners, not-for-profit organizations as well. And so these partners are key to this work in terms of providing job opportunities for our students, talking through how to support these students long-term and how they are gonna impact the greater community as a whole. And so I know we are uh, strapped for time here, so I tried to kind of move through this pretty quickly, but I do wanna pause just to see if there are any questions that you all may have. All right, so um, I thank you for your time. If there are uh, anything that you are interested in learning more about, or if you would like for us to work with your community college in your district, in terms of thinking through currency, we would love to hop on a call and talk through those particular opportunities as well. Thank you. Thank you again, Jason and Bill for, for supporting this work. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Megan. And again, I think that the we know the community college Currency components, as Megan pointed out, as, as you've heard lots of us talk about lots of times, I mean, Suck Valley, you know, big shout out to them for on their own, taking advantage of the work being done locally by multiple districts and that the community college invested in from the very beginning, uh, four years ago, and, and now seeing, seeing this work uh, with community colleges uh, near and far is is a great next step and, and providing that, that direction. So Megan, that update was great. And we look forward to this will definitely be a topic that I am I am sure we will all continue to talk about. And so the one the one shout out I'll give us and and probably a re, uh, all of us is to remember to be not be shy about talking about this with people uh, in our communities and and kind of bragging about the work 
and about our students. And as Eric talked about with, with the board at, at Ridgewood, getting our students out in front of them and letting our students do the talking because that will, that will also make a huge difference. And so I think there's definitely a lot of work that uh, we can probably do to support those efforts too as we move further down the road. And by we, I'm referring to the NIU team and, and in collaboration with the ISB team. And so we will seek to, to do that. With that said, um, we do know today was a much longer meeting and everybody's got a million things to do. Um, we will be posting the recording of the meeting on our YouTube channel and we will send that out. I did start the recording a few minutes late. I apologize about that. That pre-conversation was so interesting that I, I lost track of that. And we will send out not only the link to the recording when that's up, but a link to the slides as well. Um, Bill, anything you wanna add before we wrap up here? No, I just wanna say thank you for everyone. Uh, this meeting was a, lo a lot longer, and uh, but we were happy to share those results from the surveys and have our speakers, Eric and Michelle, uh, come and present and also Megan from Ed Systems. Thank you for uh, coming in here and, and sharing that wealth of information for uh, Illinois schools. Thank you everyone for coming. We're gonna go ahead and uh, stop uh, the video.